Well, joining us tonight is Dr. Steve Pachenik. He's one of the world's most experienced international crisis negotiators and hostage negotiators. He's worked for over 20 years in this field for over five U.S. administrations. And of course, he's worked with Tom Clancy on a couple of book series, the Tom Clancy Op Center and NetForce book series. We want to talk to him tonight about his take on the Edward Snowden documents, what he believes is behind this as someone experienced in the intelligence community, as well as what he thinks is going on in the Ukraine. Welcome, Dr. Pachenik. What's foremost on your mind tonight? Well, let me tell you what I think would be relevant for okay. both our answers. Number one is Snowden and what it really means in terms of intelligence and the amount of money that we're paying for it, which is $60 billion, and why Snowden is very similar to Ellsberg. Mm -hmm. from the blog that I wrote. The yes. second thing that we can talk about is, in fact, what constitutes uh, the change in government, why we are, in many ways, in a military coup, and what's been happening all over the world. Because in Thailand, there's a coup. In Pakistan, there's a coup. Uh, there's going to be a coup as well. And Egypt was a military coup. And why is America not having a military coup? Well, we do. Because mm -hmm. every legislative area is under military control. So mm -hmm. what does that mean in light of the Snowden and in light of everything else that we're talking about? What I'm basically saying throughout all of this from my experience is that we have a, a whole phenomenon going on that has nothing to do with the national security or the legitimacy of the United States. And that's the military and the industrial complex playing around at the expense of the American public. So it's draining out $60 billion or $150 billion, depending on how you count the appropriations, because now we're beginning to falter as a superpower. On the one hand, we have the superpower position, but we're not. The other thing that's very major for us, I would talk about two of them. One is the position in the Middle East, why we had to get out, and why today we had problems in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we didn't plan to have those uh, consequences of war, the collateral damage. In other words, we went into two countries that we had no right to go in as a result of the incompetency of our presidency. So what I want to get at is that we have had for over 40 years, Republican or Democrats, really incompetent presidents who have not really understood of war, the nature of financial restitution, and the nature of, of what it is that we Americans need to have, which is prosperity, entrepreneurship, and you know, a middle class. It has nothing to do with being Republican or Democrat. In turn, we have wasted our resources into the Middle East, and now we're shifting into a far more dangerous area. That's why Silicon Valley is secondary to me, although it may be primary to you, and that is China and Japan, where there really can be conflict mm -hmm. over the Spratly Islands, over oil, and why we're shifting, and why, again, we don't necessarily have a basic interest. Uh, you know, it begins into the nature of, it really gets into the nature of what is America right now? And, and does it have relevancy to its political system? And the answer is no. Yeah, you wrote in your blog, that's a very good point. You wrote in your blog that the relevance of the intelligence community is much like the military. It's relevant only to itself. You said our military has no need for the U.S. Right. The U.S. has no need for the military. And it's right. the same way with yes. the civilian military intelligence yes. community. And that's what they feel. They've been very clear to me and to others that since they went to war and we had no support for the military whatsoever, which we haven't. Now, remember, we haven't had support for our military since 1940s. Our war in Korea was a disaster. The Vietnam War was a disaster. The Iraq wars were a disaster. Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan. So what does the military say? Forget it. We'll just go to anywhere we want. We'll create wars, even with, you know, the president, who may or may not be CIA, but he is. And mm -hmm. we'll just create drone attacks. And most people don't care. That's right. And most people aren't relevant. So what I'm saying is, yeah, we have a major disintegration of our institutions that is primarily uh, represented by the military, the intelligence community, which constitutes a major part of our budget because we're in 732 bases in 234 countries. We don't have that many terrorists. Yeah. So we really have begun to start to disintegrate internally and externally. But we need, it's, a, it's, it's a moment of hope. Actually, the guys like you, the alternative media has really preempted modern-day media or the mainstay media, where you have guys like Anderson Cooper, we can talk about, 
who was really, uh, you know, an intern at the CIA a couple of years in a row. Mm-hmm. But he's mm-hmm. CIA. That's why I was fed this. This is not conspiracy. I mean, I've been in the business. I oversaw the CIA. I oversaw National Reconnaissance Organization. I oversaw all of them without belonging to them, but being their bosses, so to speak, because they had to report to a deputy assistant secretary of state. What that means is we are the ones who implement policy. We're the ones who create the the uh, initiatives that go overseas. In my particular case, I just dismissed the CIA for 30 years because they were incompetent. The only time they were competent was when Jimmy Carter fired over 4,000 CIA operatives. He was the first man only, and he was military. Mm-hmm. So not only did we have an inherent tension between the military and the civilians, but we've had this ongoing war where they're becoming less and less reliable. And that's why the agencies have become more reliable, and, and they're, they're drawing away our minds. Let me, so let, me ask you about, let me ask you about the Snowden leaks. Now, he's been accused sure. by the U.S. of being a Russian spy, a Chinese spy, I don't think too many people buy that line, but there are people who question whether this is a limited hangout or if he's a genuine whistleblower. You have a different take on this. Tell us what your take is on the Ed Snowden well, document. Yeah, sure. You want me to tell you? Or no? Yeah, yeah, or go I'm, ahead. I'm, yeah. Well, basically, you get, let me go back to the history of Putin and Russia. Having been, I haven't been uh, main, you know, mainly involved in the takedown of the Soviet Union. I was sent to the Rand Corporation specifically to develop the architecture for the psychological warfare of taking down the Soviet Union. It wasn't done by the CIA. It wasn't done by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. I'm not the only one, but I was one of the few who could delineate the architecture because I was trained in both political science and in psychiatry, and I'd worked in the Soviet Union over 10 years during the 70s under Nixon and Ford and Reagan take out political dissidents in psychiatric hospitals. So I had a very good idea where the weaknesses were. And I knew the KGB very well in the GRU. So when we put, took down the Soviet Union, we, in fact, made a mistake. We uh, gave it to Yeltsin. Yeltsin was misread. I must admit, I may have been part of that. I don't remember Nelson as well as I should have, but he ended up to be a drunk. But I do remember we reconstituted our attempts and put in Gorbachev. And Gorbachev, I thought, that's the one we were working with very strongly. We first had Gorbachev where we took down. Then Yeltsin came in. I'm sorry. We worked against Gorbachev. And Yeltsin came in, and Yeltsin turned out to be an alcoholic. And I was no longer in the government, but I had some input to say, look, this is not good. Russia has to reconstitute itself. We cannot have a sense of chaos in 122 different federations, which is really what Russia was. And instead, we had a guy named Putin. Putin didn't come up because he was a good guy, a bad guy. He's put up because the intelligence community, on a, on a positive sense, brought in a guy who was very strong, who was trained by Marcus Wolf and by Andropov, guys that I, I worked with and knew. So you're talking about Putin being put in. Would you say that uh, the intelligence community in the U.S. had something to do with that? I would say very uh, strongly that they have. I, I think it was a very positive move. The intelligence community was very much a part, collectively, uh, along with my initiatives at the RAND Corporation, others uh, who were specialists in the Soviet Union, from the CIA and military intelligence, had uh, the ability to take down the Soviet Union systematically, without any war. And I think that's something that both Reagan and Bush Sr. in particular, and Baker, should be very proud of, and the Americans should be proud of, because this was an example where we had regime change without the use of military forces, without the fact that uh, I know Charlie Wilson's war was emphasized as the uh, pièce de résistance for the CIA, but the, the, the takedown of the Soviet Union was far more sophisticated. It involved national character. It involved economics. It involved the use and manipulation of the KGB and many other uh, variables which was not relevant to war, but to financial uh, areas. In turn, what happened is when you bring down a regime, it takes some time, but at the same time, you have to think of what will follow the takedown of the regime. What you don't want is a power vacuum. In that power vacuum, you don't want a totalitarian leader to evolve. Having said that, what happened was the KGB entities became oligarchs and, in fact, became corrupt oligarchs. So every one of the uh, institutions or factories in the United States that was run through the Central Committee became fractionated, hybridized, and, and, and uh, cannibalized by the KGB. They took it over. 
And in fact, there was no central control. Gorbachev, it turned out, the minute we put him in and we thought he was capable of handling a very, very uh, 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 multivariate country with many different elements and ethnic groups. And remember, the Soviet Union was con consisted of 122 different countries and ethnicities. Gorbachev had failed. Then Yeltsin came in. I had left by that time, but I was still involved in the issue of, well, what will and who will manage the uh, Soviet Union and Russia? Well, the Russian Federation in and of itself is 11 time zones, so it's pretty big. Yeltsin turned out to be an alcoholic. Whether that was a misreading on behalf of our intelligence community or not, it was one of those elements that came out and had to be rectified very quickly. Within the ranks of the intelligence community in the Soviet Union or in Russia was a young man, ironically, trained first in East Germany. And who was he trained by? He was trained by someone who I had known and had encountered through a proxy, a man by the name of Marcus Wolf. Many of your listeners will know Marcus Wolf by the, the key player in the movie, uh, The Spy Who Came In from the Cold by uh, Jean-Luc Carré. Mm -hmm. Marcus Wolf was a very special spy master, perhaps the greatest spy master of all, who ran over 100,000 East German Stasi operatives, S-T-A-S-S-I. -S operatives all over East Germany and the world. He had penetrated the DND or the West German intelligence and some of our own intelligence. He was so brilliant that by the time we were able to amalgamate or integrate East Germany with West Germany, we could not arrest uh, Marcus Wolf because it would serve no purpose. Instead, he allowed his family to flee overseas and we allowed him to become a cook. In that process, a very young man who worked for the East German intelligence uh, eventually uh, trans transitioned into the uh, FSB or the KGB, and his name was Putin, Vladimir Putin. So he was identified very early on in our intelligence community as someone who was very pure Russian, pure Russian meaning not from Moscow, but from Leningrad, and whose grandfather, by the way, was a cook, not only for Tsar Alexander, but also for Stalin, and was very well entrenched in what we call the nationalist character of Russia. So he was trained not only by Marcus Wolf of East Germany, but by someone I had to work against, Andropov, the KGB, who was also a brilliant spy master. So eventually it was understood in the intelligence community that and, uh, uh, Putin would have to be the reigning ruler of uh, the new Russian Federation, which we had taken down through the Soviet system, and he would have to accrue power by becoming totalitarian and, and really Russian in nature. And he was true to form. He basically consolidated the power. He consolidated all the oligarchs. He made sure that the oligarchs were in no way involved in political uh, chicanery in Moscow. And in turn, they all received billions of dollars of corrupt uh, political cronyism types of businesses, Gazprom, as well as construction companies, as well as all types of uh, different industries that uh, they were not attuned to or they were uh, capable of running, but instead that was their political payoff on one condition, that these oligarchs never get involved in politics with Putin. Putin was to reform. And I think the success of the Social Olympics is the uh, ultimate point of uh, showing how a totalitarian leader, uh, using his skills, using his background, is able to consolidate a huge country like uh, Russia into uh, a spectacular phenomenon in the midst of a, a terrorist uh, scenario. So Putin has to be given credit, but at the same time, he arose because of the needs and concerns of the American and European intelligence branches. As so a result, Putin really worked with in collaboration with the CIA and our military intelligence to allow us to transit through Russia into Afghanistan. And we paid him a lot of money to transit into Afghanistan. And that money, in turn, he allowed us to be able to put over spies or alleged spies like Snowden. Let me, let me, ask, you this. Let me ask you this, Dr. Pachenik. If it's in the U.S.'s interest to have one person to deal with in that area, to have a consolidated Russia, and Putin was the guy that they identified as doing that, Give me your take on what's going on now in the Ukraine, where it appears that the EU and the U.S. are trying to undermine Putin. Is that your take on this? or? Well, Ukraine has always had a history of what I call divided loyalties. 